So, as I come to uh, speak a little bit about this amazing passage, um, I just want to put it into a little bit of context. Paul was speaking to the Roman church, which was a persecuted community. They believed in Jesus, and they were being persecuted for it. They were facing many challenges. And one of the challenges that they faced was the question of how their faith and their trust in the Lord fitted into a context that was hard and very challenging day to day. Romans, as a book, is an extraordinary document where Paul is writing to a community that he's never visited before, but which he is uh, speaking to and he is writing probably from somewhere near Corinth, but he is writing to them to help them in uh, in in their current situation, and he is explaining... the the whole mechanics of salvation to a community that has not, up to that that point, received apostolic teaching. So they've been preached to, they've come to faith, but they've not received apostolic teaching. So as I say, Paul is laying out the structure and the means and the methods of salvation to them so that they can put their faith in a context that is strong enough to put up with deeply challenging uh, situations that are going on for them. Our context here today is one of waiting. None of us know what is going to happen after Wednesday because we have the interviews And I didn't want to speak today without addressing, in a sense, the elephant in the room, which is that that's what we face. There's a tension in our community because we don't know what our future is going to look like. I don't know what our future is going to look like. And it's not in our hands or my hands to make any decision about that. And so it's odd for me to be standing here loving you and speaking to you uh, with that knowledge that the future is uncertain. It's strange, but my heart this morning is to pastor us through the reality that we face. And the reason that it's important for me to do that is because Just as Jesus was teaching his disciples, well, I'll put it like this. When Jesus taught his disciples, he didn't sit them down in a classroom and say, I want you to remember all these 50 things that one day you're going to have to remember and one day you're going to have to apply to your life. What happened with Jesus was he went from place to place and he took the situation that they were in And he began to speak to them from within the situation. The discipleship that he gave to them was timely. And it's very interesting to me that God uses real things, real situations, not fake situations or thought experiments, to teach us. I used to think, how am I going to learn this? How am I going to learn this? When I was a student at university, how can I learn this? I was reading this stuff in scripture. And I was trying to kind of psych myself up to learn about faith or uh, trusting God or whatever. But it, it came soon enough for me to learn how to put my trust in God through a very real situation. Very often, it is real fear It's waiting for a diagnosis. Uh, You've had a biopsy in the hospital and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So there's a very real fear. It's real fear, it's real tension, it's real situations, it's real jeopardy. 
that is going to teach us real trust and real faith. So that's why I'm addressing us this morning. So we are waiting, some of you are waiting for children or grandchildren to have exam results uh, and so on. So there's lots of this kind of situation that people are facing. And as I was referring a moment ago, God is interested in our hearts being able to trust him. This, this space that we're in uh, has a technical name. I don't know if you've come across it. It's called liminal space. Uh, and, and basically, it just means that we're in the space of a threshold. We're in the place between things. So we're, we're not in that season, and we're not in that season we're floating, and we sometimes call it being in limbo. But God's priority is always, in everything, his priority is our hearts. And he's wanting to grow us. And one of the themes of our sermons over the last few weeks is that God wants to grow us up in faith. So the challenge for us is how should I be today? How should I hold myself? How should I, how, how should I um, conduct myself and what should I think? And, and particularly, what will I focus my mind on right now? Jesus prepared his disciple for the ultimate trial, which of course was his crucifixion, and the tests that the disciples would go through, and he spoke to them about the hope of what he had prepared for them. And he wanted them to focus. And in John 17, it spoke of him uh, saying that God, the Father, had kept his disciples, and he was praying for his, John, Jesus was praying for his disciples. He said, I, I don't want them taken out of the situation. They are in the world, but keep them in the situation that they're in. We have an enemy who wants to knock us off and, and batter us down and take us out of the race. But this passage in Romans speaks to us about a, a bit about that. But Jesus was saying, I'm not going to take them out of the situation, but I, Father, I pray that you will keep them in the situation. And that's where we all are now. We're in that situation of waiting and not knowing. God is not going to suddenly take us out of it. He's actually going to use it. In Hebrews, it talks about a hope that is an anchor for the soul, an anchor for the soul. And it says that hope that is seen is no hope at all. If you know what's happening, then it's not hope. Now, you remember from 1 Corinthians 13 uh, that there are three things that last forever. Faith, hope, and love. These three remain, and the greatest of these is love. Hope that sits between faith and love is very often the least explored and the least understood of those three divine, eternal virtues. It's least understood because of this, it's a bit difficult to get your hand on. But that hope that we have is that God has a plan. And that plan is being worked out. And that plan involves today and his plan affects today and when in the uh, passage it spoke about um, the, the hope that we have it says that uh, God wants us basically to look like Jesus the son so it, it was that Jesus was to be the firstborn of many brothers in other words the final goal is that we as a community look just like Jesus, to all the people around us. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly feel like I'm on a journey, and I'm on the way, and I don't look like God wants me to look ultimately. And so there is a processing all the time. 
So the trials and the difficulties that we face are actually part of something that God is doing. At the beginning of Romans 8, he starts with, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He's gone through all the stuff about sin and the way that that has brought mankind down, and the only hope is Jesus. But then he says, there is therefore, for those of us who believe, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. In other words, they're not just working out of their own minds and their own passions. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. In other words, the sin that had us was leading us to death. But the spirit that now has us leads us to life and peace. So that's the whole context of this passage. And then it says, and we know that all things work together for good. Now I'm going to use the NIV, which was, was what was read. Verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. So the purpose and the predestination and the choice of God is that we should look like Jesus. That's our hope. But then before that, he says, therefore we know, if that's the case, we know that everything that happens to us is going to work together for good. Just a quick look at that. And we know. That's about confidence. That's about confidence in the nature of God who is working this whole thing out. All things. We know that all things work together for good. Surely that thing that I'm looking at, surely that painful thing, surely that error that I made, surely that can't be used what this says it says that all things for those who love God all things work together for good for those who love God who have been called according to his purpose so we're talking about that difficult childhood that I had how can that be worked together for good that difficult situation, that mistake I made, the, the, the crash that I had in this particular life situation, that illness, that how can that be used for good? This is saying that everything can be worked, will be worked, and is being worked to, together for good. It says all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So we're therefore talking about something, we're talking about the nature of the craftsman who is working it together for good. We're talking about God taking appalling situations and somehow weaving them into the fabric of our lives in such a way that beauty comes out of them. This is the hope that we have, that there is nothing that God cannot use. And I'm sure that in this place, there are things where your heads are going. Is that possible? And it is the testimony of many that even the worst stuff, God has this amazing way of working together for good. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Brethren, And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. He is in this inexorable purpose to complete the job, which is, means that he's going to lead us to the place where we're glorified by his presence in our lives and he is glorified by his presence in our lives and that we can look back and say that God is the one that's done it. 
that every situation, even this horrid situation we're in of waiting, we don't know what the future holds. And all I know is that this passage is giving me total confidence that God is able to keep St. Luke's in the purpose that he has already demonstrated through the things that are happening here. I see so much evidence of his presence, of him working in our lives. I see evidence of people growing up, coming to faith, and learning about God. And that's brilliant. So I have every confidence because of this. But then it says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How, shall, how will he not also, along with, with him, graciously give us all things? He who has given the greater thing, Jesus his son, how will he not also, along with him, give us the lesser thing? It's like, with Jesus comes the whole package. And one of the things that we need to learn is how to feel that, how to experience it, how to be confident that that's the fact. Then it says, who will bring anything against, bring any charge, sorry, against those whom God has chosen? We have an enemy. We have one who wants to bat us out, take us out of the race, take us, uh, knock us down and smash us up. We do have an enemy. But in the context of the fight and the battle that we have, God is showing us that if God is for us, who can be against us? Some of you face huge battles. Some of you are seeing huge obstacles between where you need to be and where you are today. And last week, we talked about Goliath and David. And it was just this wonderful sense that God was able to give the anointing to David to see the stone fly into Goliath and take him out. And the stones, uh, traditionally, sort of, it speaks of little rocks, if you like, words. Just like Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So taking the word of God and putting your trust in the word of God. So we have an enemy, but he has no legal rights to touch us because if God is for us, who can be against us? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus is praying for us today. He's seated in heavenly places and he's praying for us. And what we've got here is a total confidence that everything is working together for us. We have the master craftsman, God himself, weaving our lives together to make a beautiful tapestry out of every last thread and situation uh, to, to reveal something of his great ability and his goodness towards us and love. Then it talks about the circumstances that we face. Shall, uh, what shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. The pattern for all of our Christian experience is the cross. Jesus experienced all that the world could throw at him. He trusted the Father. He said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. This is the pattern for us to deal with every situation that we face. The cross. But not just the cross, the resurrection. It's the power of resurrection coming up through. So in the moment of trial, 
we put our trust in him. And when we look back after the Lord's deliverance has come, we say we trusted. And that's how things become part of the fabric of our lives. And then I'm, it says, no, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. God's love is the ultimate context in which we must place every situation that we face. This waiting that we're in, we don't know where St. Luke's is going, going to, what it's going to look like. We don't know. But we are living in the context of God's father love for us, of the demonstrated love through the cross of Je- and resurrection of Jesus, and the power of the Spirit who is at work amongst us, giving us evidence that he is present. God is with us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what we've heard is that there are circumstances in life that God is using as a laboratory, as a context, maybe to polish off some of those corners that we need uh, polishing off, maybe for us to be strengthened by the circumstances that we're in. It, It is no glory to God that when some small situation happens, we, we suddenly feel, we take offense, and we suddenly feel completely disabled by a situation that we're in. It would be no good if just because we're in this time of waiting, suddenly everybody fell apart. You know, we weren't able to do what we... Now, I know that's not happening. And I know that there's a level of maturity here. And I know that there's faith about the future. And I know that there's a revelation of God's love here. But I'm just saying that in this context to say, let's trust him. Let's simply trust him. Whether the answer is one thing or another thing, whatever the situation is that we face next week, whatever it is, let us trust him that he has good for us here at St. Luke's. That is how I'm setting my mind. That is how I'm encouraging us all to set our minds, that we walk in confidence that God is working all things together for good. When it says, um, for your sake we face death all day long, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. I slightly smile because I can see Paul say, I've got used to it, you get used to it. That sense that we are in the hands of God, as it were, like a sheep just waiting to be slaughtered. Paul knew that that thing was the secret of his fruitfulness, being vulnerable, being open, letting God do what he wanted to do. It wasn't him trying to save himself. He had so put his trust in God that he was at peace. Wonderful. So the ultimate thing that I want to leave us today with today is that we are called to be a people of peace, that we live with the peace of God in our hearts, sovereignly guarding us, because we know that in the end, we are God's people, trusting him to shape our end. And as we say at the end of communion, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God the Father and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Isn't that beautiful? That's where we're heading. Because if we're not heading there, we're just building a club. 
And I'm not interested in building a club anywhere. That just is nice for a few people. We're here as the people of God with the mission of God, which is to reach the people out here who are desperate because they're living in darkness and they haven't got that hope and they haven't got that peace that we know the gospel of Jesus Christ is offering. That's the purpose of us being here today, is that we grow in that. The peace of God which passes all understanding. I love to think of that as the peace of God which makes no sense. If you look at your situation, it makes no sense to be at peace in this situation. I can say that I have known that, and I think some of you observed me knowing that in the middle of quite a storm. But that is what we're here about. It is that the peace of God rules our hearts. That's the plan. That's the purpose. So that we look just like Jesus to the people who are outside. Amen.